Welcome to the history of water in the semi-arid southeastern Sheridan County. Two of the main resources for water in the semi-arid southeastern Sheridan County are Clear Creek and the Powder River. With the U.S. Western expansion, water has been managed in this area as a natural border for the Plains Indian Tribes land treaties, water rights for a territory, and also being redirected for irrigation for ranching and agriculture. This program will look at how water altered the landscape in southeastern Sheridan County region and the social histories that are related to these changes. Try to imagine the land of Sheridan County open with no fences or modern day roads. Several native Indian tribes moved towards this area between 1450 and 1870. Some tribes followed the seasonal migration of the Plains bison and others will push west from the Western expansion. By the mid 1800s, the Plains Indian tribes felt the impact of the Western expansion with more settlers moving west. Increased number of Euro-American immigrants were traveling west to settle in the newly acquired territories of Oregon and California. By 1849, the California gold rush increased the number of travelers. As more travelers came through the area, more natural resources were used and caused tensions between the travelers and the Plains Indian tribes. The U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs arranged a huge gathering in September of 1851 at Fort Laramie to discuss treaties and the newly assigned territories for each Indian tribe. The treaty was to establish peace between the U.S. government and the tribes while allotting tribes their own sovereignty and hunting grounds. Some of the tribes who attended the gathering for the 1851 treaty were the Cinnaboines, several bands of the Lakota, Crow, Arapaho, Cheyennes, Blackfeet, Mandans, and the Hidatsa. The 1851 treaty is also known as the Horse Creek Treaty. The treaty was negotiated and signed 30 miles downriver from Fort Laramie at the mouth of Horse Creek. The tribes camped near this area and it is because there is lack of forage for the tribe's horses near Fort Laramie. During the establishment of 1851 treaty, the Powder River became a natural boundary for the land treaty with the Crow tribe on the western side and the Lakota on the eastern side of the river. This is the treaty's description of the land location for the Crow territory, and it is estimated around 38 million acres. From the 1851 treaty, listen how waterways and natural boundaries were used to describe the borders. The territory of the Crow Nation, commencing at the mouth of Powder River on the Yellowstone, thence up Powder River to its source, thence along the main range of the Black Hills and Wind River Mountains to the headwaters of the Yellowstone River, thence down the Yellowstone River to the mouth of 25 Yard Creek, thence to the headwaters of the Muscle Shell River, thence down the Muscle Shell River to its mouth, thence to the headwaters of Big Dry Creek and then to its mouth. I would also like to share with you some of the place names for the Powder River. For the Crow tribe, the place name means where men were covered with snow. This description refers to members of the Crow tribe who were part of a war party and got caught in a snowstorm and some of the members froze to death. The Lakota place name means Shifting Sand River which describes the Powder River's um, actual physical description of the Powder River. In the mid 1800s, when Wyoming was a territory, the water was claimed on a first come first served basis. 
This idea of water rights was borrowed from gold mines in California and Colorado, which was known as squatter rights. The basic idea behind the water claim was the person who claimed the water source had the better right than anyone who came along later. Territorial legislation agreed it would be good to record these claims on paper. Water claims that were recorded were not uncommon to have someone claim more water than what actually flowed in the stream. As more people came with the Western expansion and the Wyoming territory grew, people also started to argue over conflicting claims and these arguments were taken to the territorial court. The judges didn't have the specific knowledge pertaining to water rights and usually lean towards the amount on the recorded paper claim or even the size of the ditch. This is a 1883 map of the Wyoming Territory. And if you notice, Johnson County is where our current day Sheridan County would be. Sheridan County was founded in 1888. In 1888, Elwood Mead was hired as the Wyoming Territorial Engineer. Elwood grew up on a Southern Indiana farm on the Ohio River. In his farming community, their main problem was getting rid of water. Mead spent his first years out of engineering school along the Front Range in Colorado, learning about irrigation and listening to the fights about the water. He read about battles that had gone on in California concerning water. Mead thought people could do a better job handling Western water and thought that building communities would help support these communities with their water concerns. His main job as the Wyoming Territorial Engineer was to figure out what claims were actually surveyed on the county courthouse books and the overall Wyoming water rights situation. These tasks would begin the drafting of a new water laws. One of the first changes Meade did for the water law was to have an active state ownership of the water. He established that no one could acquire rights to use water without a permit from the state. Meade's second change was to set up an expert board known as the Board of Control to decide water disputes instead of a court of law. The Board of Control is comprised of the state engineer and the superintendents of each of the state's four main hydrological basins that are the watersheds of the North Platte, Green Snake and Bear, Wind Bighorn, and the Powder River. These superintendents have knowledge of water and to whom irrigators could bring issues to. Meade's new water law was drafted and voted into the Wyoming State Constitution in 1890. Today, Meade's idea of tying water rights to actual use is still in effect as a water management system. Early Wyoming water history of southeastern Sheridan County relates to the Clear Creek Valley region and is known for one of the earliest ranches, the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company. Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company extended their cattle operation in the late 1870s from Sydney, Nebraska. They established cattle and hay production in two areas, one known as Big Red, which is present day U-Cross, and the other is Big Corals, which is east of Claremont. The majority of the land was acquired by the desert land entries of 1862 and the Homestead Act. Similar to the 1862 Homestead Act, the Desert Land Act promoted the economic development of the arid and semi-arid public lands of the Western states. Proud and Ferris started out as a freighting business and freighted goods to the mining camps of the Black Hills and became the biggest company sh shipping freight in the Northwest Nebraska. A description in the Lighters to Littles book published by the Claremont Historical Group 
describes what freighting looked like. Quote, the great wagons could carry 7,500 to 8,000 pounds and had front wheels three feet in diameter and rear wheels five feet in diameter. They were normally pulled by seven or eight yokes of oxen. There are reports of 21 yokes of oxen pulling one wagon across the Sandy North Platte River, end quote. By 1879, Pratt and Ferris moved beyond freighting to a new opportunity of raising cattle. Two ranches were established on the North Platte River and in the late 1870s, they extended their operation and settled on the Clear Fork known today as Clear Creek. The cattle company was organized and incorporated in Laramie County, Wyoming in 1879. Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company established some of the early irrigation ditches in the southeastern Sheridan County area by 1884. It is noted that if a cowboy was a good cow hand, he earned 30 to $40 a month plus room and board. The shareholders were James H. Pratt and partners Cornelius Ferris, Marshall Field, and Levi Z. Leiter. These were the Chicago investors, and then also Mr. Robert M. Fair. So I'm going to give you some background on the shareholders and investors of the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company. All the investors were considered an American entrepreneur in their own right. So James H. Pratt was a rancher, farmer, freighter, and frontier entrepreneur of the post-Civil War era. While James Pratt was a post-trader in the Dakota Territory in 1870, he became associated with Cornelius Ferris. Also, he was also his brother-in-law, and they furnished beef to forts and the Indian agencies. Hence the name Pratt and Ferris for their freighting company, which involved, evolved to the cattle company. Another investor is Mr. Marshall Field, who was the founder of the Marshall Field Company. This was a large based in Chicago department store. Marshall Field was noted as one of the richest men in Chicago and the United States. James Pratt was married to Marshall Field's sister, Louise. Levi Leiter was Marshall Field's senior partner in 1865 for their dry goods store called Field, Leiter & Company. By 1881, Leiter sold his share of the business and the store name changed to Marshall Field & Company. This business connection is how Levi Leiter eventually came to invest in the Clear Creek Valley and the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company. So partnerships changed for the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company and by 1898, James Pratt and Levi Z. Leiter bought out the remaining stockholders for the cattle company. During 1892 to 1898, Levi's son, Joseph, was his agent that managed the business. From 1897 to 1898, Joseph attempted to corner the U.S. wheat market. He was briefly the largest individual holder of wheat in the history of the grain trade. Joint action from Joseph Leiter's competitors broke his corner on the market. Levi Leiter passed away in June of 1904 and the property became the Leiter Estate, which stretched along Clear Creek from the Johnson County line to the community of Leiter that is located between Claremont and Arveda. Grain elevators are historic reminders of this time period along the stretch of land on Route 1416. Joseph Leiter was the manager of the Leiter estate after his father's death, and soon after he brought a friendly lawsuit for the division of the property between James Pratt and his family heirs of the Levi Leiter estate. Levi Leiter 
um, did not want his state divided among his heirs. This was in his will until the last of his children had passed away. Some of the estate consisted of holdings in downtown Chicago real estate, farms, coal mines in Illinois, Montana, Colorado, and Utah, and of course, the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company. The estimated value of the estate was between 50 to $100 million. James Pratt, the partner of the cattle company, received a settlement for the Little Moon Ranch on the Wyoming and Nebraska border, and this was the end of the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company. The lawsuit between the Leiter heirs, which was Levi Leiter's children, Mary, Nancy, Daisy, and Joseph, cost millions of dollars. The two older sisters, Mary and Nancy, gave their power of attorney to Joseph. But Daisy, the youngest sister, tried to oust her brother as trustee on the grounds of mismanagement of the estate. Settlement of the suit was in favor of Joseph Leiter. In 1910, Joseph Leiter announced the news of the Lake DeSmet project. This project offered vast irrigation and a switch from growing hay to an open range system that would grow sugar beets. This focus was on advancing irrigation techniques in this region to farm crops rather than sheep and cattle operations. So within the orange circle area, um, this is where the lighter estates was established. By 1921, the Lake DeSmet project expanded the irrigation and farming in Clear Creek Valley to over 6,000 acres from Big Red to Big Corals that were under the new irrigation system. During this process of the irrigation project, the lighter estate properties began to be divided up into individual tenant farms. The tenant farm project leased the land to individuals and the Russian German immigrants who had come to America and to the West, um, most of these farmers grew sugar beets. The Clear Creek Valley was one of many US Western regions to grow sugar beets. As a result, many Volga German families settled along Clear Creek and began farming which aided in the establishment of sugar beets as one of Wyoming's top crops. The Volga Germans immigrated to America from the time periods of 1871 to World War II, about estimated 1941. In the late 1800s, they began to leave their agricultural life near the Volga River in Russia which this map here shows the Volga River region. This was due, they left because this was due to a change of power over Russia and being forced into military service. These German immigrants were invited to the Volga region in Russia to farm Russian land. Catherine the Great allowed the German immigrants to maintain their language and culture with her agricultural invitation. The, the Volga Germans who immigrated to Clear Creek Valley brought with them their historic German farming methods as well as their German identity that established a close-knit community in the southeastern Sheridan County area. From the book, The White Root, based around several Volga German families' experiences who farmed in the Clear Creek Valley, there are wonderful descriptions of the agricultural process of sugar beets. And I'm going to share with you um, the one about planting the seeds and also thinning the seeds. But the descriptions in the book take it all the way up to the harvest time. So quote, labor began in the spring. Most families lived in labor shacks near the beet fields. The work began with the beet seed, a coarse, un uneven seed, half the length of a small fingernail. The seeds were densely planted to grow an inch high. 
They were carefully thinned by hoeing away most of the seed leaves, leaving clusters between each length of the hoe. No hoe could cut so closely as to leave only one plant. So the extra beets were picked out by hand, leaving the strongest seedling from each remaining group. The larger the beet seed, the more sugar it would yield, increasing the value of the total harvest. Every abled, the larger the beet, the more sugar it would yield, increasing the value of the total harvest. Every abled body family member would work in the fields. Work would continue in spite of heat, gnats, reddened knees, and sore muscles. Thinning the beets required crawling along a row. People crawled scores of miles through season after season, thinning seedling beets, end quote. For around four decades, the Volga Germans farmed the Clear Creek Valley and held on to their German heritage while facing difficulties when the unpredictable weather conditions that affected their crops and the anti-American sentiment during World War I and World War II. The expansion of irrigation in this area of southeastern Sheridan County was one of many aspects that was part of the development of settlement and advanced agriculture production in this semi-arid region. Thank you for joining our program 